begin. Um, so uh, today, is, this week is BMO week. So uh, we're going to have uh, we're going to start uh, our lecture series on BMO with a mini course offered by Danielle Garella from Spain. Um, anyway, so D Danielle. Okay, thank you very much. Well, let me start uh, thanking Javada or, or in general the organizer of this uh, program. Uh, for organizing this uh, so nice uh, program and for giving me the opportunity to participate in it. Well, I'm going to speak on BMO, but essentially since, since we are uh, in this program is on analytic function space, I'm going to speak about analytic BMO, BMO A. Uh, so, um, well, BMO, you all know uh, what a BMO function is. Uh, BMO functions actually uh, have is, its origin in the setting of Rn. If, if we have a, what was the problem here? It's not, it's not moving now. It was moving before. No? Oh. Uh, it's not m m moving now, so. No, uh, it's, not, it's not moving now. Uh, that's, uh, that's it. Oh, now oh, it's moving. Yeah, here we uh, go. You know, if we have a, a function in, in L1 lock of Rn, uh, um, and we have a cube in Rn, then uh, we can take the mean of f over q. So, so we take the integral of f and we divide by the measure of the cube. And this is the mean of f over the cube q. And then we can consider the, uh, the mean over q of this, of, of this, or the difference between f and the uh, mean of f over q with absolute value. So this quantity that we have over here is the mean oscillation of the function f over the cube q. Then we are going to, we say that f is in BMO of our n, say that uh, BMO comes from bounded mean oscillation, if this oscillation are, are bounded, are uniformly bounded. So F is in BMO if the supremum of these quantities over all cubes uh, is fine. Well, uh, if, if we start with the definition, then we can see that there is no relation at all between uh, this and analytic functions, let's say in the disk, which is what we have been working over the, over the weeks since this program started. But anyway, we are going to see that VMO are uh, very, very closely related to analytic function in the disk. And so we are, of course, we will work in one dimension. Uh, let's see. Um, some of, one of the first causes that was given in this, in this program was on hard spaces. And let's say that probably two of the most important results in the theory of hard space are the uh, Enrich conjugation theorems and the uh, duality theory. Well, the Enrich, or you all know what the Enrich conjugation theorem says, that is that if we have uh, an index between one and infinity extremely bigger than one and extremely smaller than infinity, then the conjugation operator f into f tilde f tilde is the conjugate function of f, is bounded on LP of t. T denotes the, the unit circle, the, the, the unit circle. Well, I have written this in terms of function defined in the circle, but we can also uh, write it in, in terms of harmonic function in the, in the disk. Uh, little hp is, is the hard space of harmonic function, so it's the, the space of harmonic function in the disk so that the integrals mean of order p uh, over the circle of radius r are bounded, and so the endless conjugation theorem can be written in, in terms of harmonic function. So it says that the conjugation operator that, that sends a function u into its conjugate is bounded on hp for p between one and infinity. Uh, well, as I have said, this result is true between one and infinity. It is well known that this is not true uh, for p equal one. For p equal one, we have some weak type inequality, but anyway, I'm not going to speak about p equal one. I'm going to be interested in p equal infinity. The result is not uh, true for p equal infinity. In fact, we have that if, if uh, a function is in h infinity, it may not 
the conjugate function may not belong to H is infinite. Uh, there are uh, functions which are analytic in the disk so that the real part of F is bounded, but the imaginary part is unbounded. I guess that the more simple example is uh, I times log of one plus Z over one minus Z. The function, these functions uh, sense the unit disk into a, into a vertical, into a vertical strip. So we have the unit disk and if we apply this function F, this goes to a vertical strip. So, so we have that the real of F is bounded, but the imaginary part. So the Enrich conjugation theorem is not true for P equal uh, infinity. Uh, uh, of course, uh, since, uh, since H infinity, the bounded harmonic function are in A in little HP, if we use the risk conjugation theorem, the risk theorem, what we have is that, is that if F is in H infinity, uh, well, like here I, I should say L infinity, this is an errata. If F is in L infinity, then F tilde is in LP for all P, for all finite P. But actually it's a classical result. Actually, I, I don't know exactly um, to whom is, it is due for sure. It appears in Sigmund's book on trigonometric series that if F is in, is in L infinity, then and we have uh, the conjugate function satisfies a, a exponential inte integrability. If we have a function in L infinity, then there is a constant alpha, but actually it depends only on the L infinity norm of F, a positive constant, so that the, the integral of exponential of alpha F tilde uh, is fine. So this is, of course, the result which is stronger than this one, that if F is in L infinity, then F tilde is fine. So this is what is um, known, a classical result that are known for uh, the conjugation operator acting on L infinity. The other result that I said that was quite important in the theory of Hardy spaces was the, the duality theory. The, you all know the, the duality theory for Hardy space. Uh, also when P is between one and infinity, it says that if, we, if P is between one and infinity, then the dual of HP is isometrically isomorphic to HQ, where Q is the conjugate exponent to P. Uh, actually, the, the, uh, the, and this, this, this isometric isomorphism is given in this way. Uh, if we have uh, G and H cubes, so D is five sub G of F defines it this way, the integral of F times G, till G in G bar, uh, defines a, li a bounded linear operator in HP which has the same node as the function. So this is the classical uh, duality theorem in HP, which is the analog to the one for LP spaces. Actually, one, one uses the, the, the duality theorem for LP spaces, one uses the Hamana theorem and things like that, and one gets this. So this, uh, these are two very important results that are true for P between one and infinity. And as I say, uh, the first result is not, uh, the first result uh, regarding the conjugate function cannot be extended to P equal infinity. And about this is also true that the dual of uh, H1 cannot be uh, identified with H infinity. And let's, and we will try to solve, uh, to obtain uh, the substitute of these two theorems for P equal infinity. And BMO uh, shows up in solving these two questions. Uh, as, as I, this is what just was I said. BMO function show up in the theory of analytic function showing uh, in connection with the substitute of the above two theorems, the uh, risk conjugation theorem at, at the theorem about the duality of HP when we go to, to P equal infinity. Actually, as I said before, BMO function in, uh, show up in the context of uh, an of function defined in Rn, L1 log function in Rn. They were they were introduced by John and Nirenberg in 1961, and they applied results that they obtained to a smoothness problem in partial differential equations. 
So actually to start with, uh, this was defined the setting of Rn and to start with, this has no relation at all with analytic function spaces, even in the, in the one dimensional case. However, in the middle of the 1960s, Span and Stein independently proved that it, there is a close connection between BMO function and the conjugation apparatus. Working in, in one dimension, I will define this properly in, in, in a minute. If we have a function in L infinity of this of the circle, then the conjugate function F tilde is, is going to have um, bounded mean oscillation. So, um, and regarding the duality of HP, uh, sometimes later, Pfefferman showed that the dual of H1 can be identified with what we are going to call BMOA, analytic BMO. So this is, we are going to try to see these two things in, in some details, but just to start, I, I just mentioned these two results, which are the basic of the, of the connection of BMO function and analytic function space. Well, uh, then, let, let, well, before we get into, let, let us give some general reference about the BMO function. Uh, this, the first one is a paper by Alvestein. Alvestein was my advisor, my thesis advisor, and I'm very much indebted to him. I learned a lot from him, and he wrote a very nice paper uh, on analytic function in, on both the link oscillation, which was published in 1980. Then of course, Garnett's book on bounded analytic function is a very good reference for, for a lot of facts having to do with, with analytic function and in particular having to do with PMO function. Uh, of course, we have this uh, very nice book by Saracen, Function Theory on the Unit Circle, which was published in 1978. And then some like 20 years ago, I wrote a uh, I participated in a, in a, a, I think it was a summer school in Mekrajarvi in Finland. And then uh, I, and I gave a course on bounded mean oscillation. And then I wrote a, a, paper, a long paper of more than 100 pages on analytic function on, the, on bounded mean oscillation. So these are, um, let's say, four general reference about on, on BMO, A, essentially analytic BMO. That um, um, of course I'm not in this course. I'm I'm going to give some results. I'm going to give some proofs, but of course I cannot prove uh, everything. Um, but um, uh, most of the things can be found uh, in, in in this paper. In particular, I I guess that I can maybe I can I can upload this paper for uh, later on uh, so that everybody can have many of the things that I'm going to talk about are included in here and, and, and some of the proofs can be found there even in China. So I will upload this maybe in the, in the, in the chat. So these are reference and then let's see, let's start a little bit. So we are going to work actually in, in function defined in the unit set. So the definition is just the, the one similar to the one that I gave before for a function defined in L1 of R. If we have a function which is in L1 of T here, we, we don't have to say L1 log because we are, we are working in the compact case. So if we have a function in, in, in L1 of the circle and I is an interval, we consider Ni of F the mean of F over the interval I. So, so this I deep bar I, this means that the length of the interval. So Ni of F is the mean of F of the, the, the interval. Then we consider the mean oscillation of f over the, the interval i, which is the mean of the different of the difference of the absolute value of the difference between f and the mean of f of f. So this is the mean oscillation of f over i. So then we say that f is a function of bounded mean oscillation in the circle, or that f is in BMO of the circle if the supremum of these quantities is fine. Is the supremum as i ranges over all or interval. So what we are going to call this supremum is going to call, we are going to call it f uh, double uh, star norm of f, one over uh, the length of i integral of f i of the absolute value of f minus the mean of f over. 
Okay, this is the definition that we have of BMO. As I said, I, we are going to work in the in the unit set. Of course, this is this is a semi norm. Actually, a constant function or constant function for all constant functions this is zero. If we want, uh, sometimes this is defined in, in, in the setting of our end. Then, actually, but here, since here we are working in the set in the compact case, so we can we can define quickly an or. So if we add the, 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 the integral over the whole interval or, or over the whole circle of F, then in this way, we get an, a, a real norm on F. So what we are going to call the BMO norm of S is going to be the F star, which is the supremum of this or those oscillation plus uh, the absolute value or the, or the mean of F over the whole interval. Well, it is not difficult to see that actually this is an OR and that BMO with this is a Banach space. And also it is completely clear that L infinity is contained in BMO and we have, and we have this. Uh, actually, the, it is important to know that the inclusion, that the inclusion, this inclusion is a strict. The typical example of a function which is in BMO, but is not in L infinity is the log of t. We have uh, the log of absolute value of t when t is between zero and pi in, in absolute value. This function is in the This is an easy calculation uh, taking the the, uh, the mean, the oscillation and so on. So this is, a, uh, this is the typical example of a BMO function which is not bad. Well, uh, it's probably the most important result that John and Nirenberg proved when they introduced um, BMO is uh, what, what is usually called the John Nirenberg theorem. The John Nirenberg theorem uh, established uh, exponential inequality on the distribution function of the of f, of, well, actually of f minus, of the oscillation of f. So the John Nirenberg theorem uh, said that there exist two positive constant k and beta so that if we have a, a BMO function and we have an interval, then if we, if we take the, the set of the interval where the difference between F and the mean of F over I in absolute value is bigger than lambda, uh, and, and we divide by the length of I, then since it's bounded by this constant K e to the minus beta lambda over F star. And this is for every lambda um, positive. Uh, this is, as I said, I'm not going to, to get into the proof of, of the result. This is, let's say, the classical, the, what is usually called the John Nirenberg theorem. I guess it was the, the main theorem that they proved in the paper where they introduced BMO uh, But, but then, let's see, this, this result, uh, this implies that the uh, function in BMO satisfies an integrability condition, and, and in particular, if we use the John Nirenberg theorem and the expression on the LP naught in terms of the distribution function, the, the, the well known, this is the, the usual well known uh, expression of the LP naught of a function in terms of the distribution function, you will have, a, and this is true in any measure space, you would take the integral of absolute value of h to the p, is the p times the integral of lambda p minus one times, here we have the distribution function of the absolute value of h. Then if you if one if you one uses the John Nirenberg theorem and uses this this well known result, then one of them uh, really that if, if we have a function which is in BMO, then actually <coughs> then actually uh, we we can we can we can obtain a, 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 an, an expression which is equivalent. What, 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 which is equivalent to which I guess which I guess that there is, was some problem. The, the problem is that I guess that I, I missing so the transparency. The transparency is that we can put here instead of the L1 naught, we can put here supremo over P. And over P. Then I guess that there, there was some, then we define this. Instead of taking the L1 naught, we take the LP naught of f minus the ni of f, and then we take this, and then this is what we are going to call f star p of f. And actually, as I said, using the John Nirenberg theorem and this and this uh, expression of the LP norm in terms of the 
of the of the distribution function, what we get is that this is equivalent to what we call f star. F star was taking here p equal to. So this is in particular. In particular, this tells us that uh, actually BMO function are in all ELP spaces, are in all P spaces, and all, all these nodes are equivalent. The, this, this is the, the, the node with P equal to one, and then this is when we take LP. So actually, this, well, I have, I have written here for P bigger than one, but actually, we can write this even for p bigger than six. But anyway, since we want to work with north, uh, let, let us restrict to p bigger than. Okay. So the thing is, the, this is the main consequence of the John Lennon bell theorem that we can take not only L1 north, but we can take LP north for any p positive. And then we have a, an equivalent definition for any p bigger than six. Okay. So this, but so far, so far we we see no relation of this with uh, with analytic function space. Let's see that there is some relation. And actually, uh, to start with, let, let, let's see what what I'm going to say that we can see BMO as a conformally invariant space. What we do is the following: when we took uh, the f star norm, what we did here was we took we took the F and here we subtracted the mean of F over the interval I and then we divide it by that. But, but then we are going to change this thing. Let's, we are going to define a new quantity, which is going to be F2 star. And we, what we do is the following. We take F, we take U the Poisson integral of F. And then we evaluate that Poisson integral in, in a point A of the disk. And then we take the, the Poisson integral of this difference uh, center at there. And then we define this, 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 this. We, we can do this for p equal one, and we can do this also for any value of p. We take f, we take the Poisson integral at a point a, and when we take. And then what, it turns out that this quantity is equivalent to f star. Let's see more or less what is the idea. The idea, I'm not going, of course, to prove this. To prove this, one uses some calderon simon uh, ideas. But let me see what, more or less what is the idea. I, took, I have here some, some small uh, things. So we have here the, the unit set, yeah? And here we have an, inter, an interval r. Then let's take here, this point A is going to, to be a point which is in the, in the radius which ends in the center of the interval I and so that the distance from A to this point is equivalent to the length of R. Then this is going to be the, the point A. So more or less what happens is that the, <clears throat> the mean of I, the mean of F, sorry, the mean of F over the interval i more or less can be thought equivalent to the u of a where u is the Poisson integral of a. And also if we take f minus the, that, that means if we are saying that more or less we, we can substitute this means by u of a. And then the other thing is that if we take the, uh, the mean of f minus u of a over, over the interval e, more or less can be substituted by the integral in T, instead of taking here, this the mean of this, we, what we take is the Poisson integral of U. You recall that the Poisson integral is an approximation of the identity that if we take the Poisson, inter, the Poisson kernel here, is essentially concentrated here at this point. So the idea is that we can substitute this like this. But of course, I, I'm not going to give the details of the proof, but let's, okay? But this is the, the, I guess this is the key fact that relates uh, BMO function with harmonic or analytic function. That we can define BMO in an equivalent way, saying that a function uh, f in, is in BMO if the supremum of these quantities as A uh, ranges over the unit, this is fine. 
here, as I recall, u is the Poisson integral of f, and, and, and here what we take is the Poisson integral of this evaluator. So what, what we have is that, that the f star north of f is equivalent to the f2 star, which is taking this for p equal one, but since we said that this was equivalent to the f star p, so in, in a similar way, this is equivalent to it. So all this, actually these are says I minor because I have not added the, the mean of f. So these quantities are equivalent for, for any p um, between one and infinity, actually even for p between zero and one, but I'm always writing this for p bigger than one. So the, this is the, 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 the way that uh, harmonic function or, and of course, analytic function show up in connection with P. We take uh, the Poisson integral of F, and then we have this. And then, but it, I said here that we can see BMO as a conformally invariant space. Let's see what, what, what do I mean by that. Uh, well, let, let us consider the, the group of all conformal mappings of the unit X into itself. Well, you will know that this group is the set of Mebius transformation of the disk into itself, and this Mebius transformation are all of the four lambda times, times phi of A, where lambda has absolute value of one, one and A is a point in the disk, and the uh, phi A of C is this Mebius transformation with sense zero to A. A maybe transformation of the this If if we just write uh, use a make a change of variables, then it is immediate that if we have a function in L1 and we take a conformal mapping of the disk into itself, then uh, then the composition uh, S composed with F is also in L1 and um, using a change of variable one obtains very easily this using the Poisson in, in the exchange of variable or thinking of what this is. This is a harmonic function. We had these boundary values and this is the same harmonic values. So we don't need to use a change of value. Just look at this, that this is a harmonic and these are two harmonic functions with the same boundary values. So, so they, they should be the same. But anyway, so we have this and also it can be proved and it's in just a, a, a simple calculus that if, if we have any point in the disk, uh, S of course is an automorphism of the disk, and um, we take B, the, the inverse image of A, then if we take one over two pi, the integral of F minus the Poisson integral of F evaluated A, and we take here the integral, the Poisson integral, this is the same as this. So this is just a matter of, of making a calculation. So if we take here the supremum in this quantity, in this first, first integral, the supremum over all A's in the, in the disk is the same as the supremum here over all B's in the disk. So in this way, what we get is that the semi-minor is conformally invariant. If we take, if I take the double star pin uh, norm of f is the same as the double star p norm of s composite. So, right, and so, uh, uh, and, and so what we have at the end is that this double star um, p uh, norm of f is the supremum of the uh, hp. This is the, the norm in the harmonic hp space of u composed with f minus u of f of u. Um, but we, we can forget about the lambda in the the, the rotation, we can forget about the, that rotation. And, and usually the way that this is written is that the supremum over all points A and D of the uh, phi A of composed with U minus the value of U of A, where U is the Poisson integral. So we have, at the end, we have this expression for the uh, BM honor of a function F. Uh, and, and we can take this for any P between A and P. So a function f in L1 of t is in BMO, if and only if for any p uh, positive, the supremum of this hp north of mm, the composition of u with all the phi a's, and we subtract the value of u of a is finite, where uh, u is the Poisson integral. So in this way, we see is the uh, this way we see we can see 
the BMO space as a conformally invariant space. So with this, uh, you see that the uh, analytic function, harmonic function show up clearly in the context in relation with H, uh, with BMO. Uh, let's see how this, this result, this, this, this characterization in this conformally invariant way give us quickly the first result that I, that I mentioned, that if f is a function in L infinity, then the conjugate function is in zero. Well, this is, this is nothing more or less. We take a function f in L infinity. We take a real, so that, and we take the Poisson integral of f. Of course, if we use uh, the, since we know that this theorem, uh, if you was in L infinity, you is in all L P spaces for P less than infinity. And so the conjugate function is in LP. Then since the conjugate is in LP, then the, the conjugate function of U, the U tilde is the Poisson integral of FT. And now the only thing that we have to do is to use the conformally invariant uh, characterization of BMO. Of course, if, if I take U, which is harmonia, I compose this with S and I take the conjugate, this is the same as com uh, the composition of S with the conjugate of U. Since the conjugate function at zero is zero, then I have to subtract here. So we have this. Uh, and then using, then, then the only thing we have to do is we, to use uh, Holden inequality and, you, and use the Parseval theorem that the, the, the conjugation operator is bounded on L2. So then we deduce easily that, well, this F double star, we use the characterization, which is the supremum of this H1 norm of this. But since this is zero, we can forget this. So this is the, the supremum of this because this is zero. And then here I simply use that the H1 norm is smaller than the H2 norm. And here I use the, <clears throat> and I, here I use the Parseval, Parseval theorem that the conjugation operator is an isometry in, in H2. And of course the H2 norm is smaller than the H infinity norm. So we go from this to this. And, but the supreme, the H infinity norm of U of this composition is just the uh, H in, uh, the L infinity norm of U, which is the L infinity norm. So in this way, we get quickly that the, uh, if F is a function in L infinity, then the conjugate function is in BMO. And of course we get this inequality with the F2 star, uh, no, the F2 star norm of F tilde is bounded by the L infinity norm. Well, this is, this was, so this give answer to the first of the two theorems that I said that were known for P equal, P less than infinity, but didn't remain true for P equal infinity. Well, I, anyway, let's see that uh, if we essentially use the same argument, but here we, here I started with the, uh, with the F2 star is with H1 not here. If, if we start here with the H2 with a similar argument, then we can prove that if F actually is in BMO, then also is true that F tilde is in BMO and we have this in the Actually, it's a, a, an argument uh, similar to the one that I have used before for H infinity, but the only difference is that here we start with H2 directly. Well, and then we can. So we, we have that the conjugation operator is bounded from L infinity into BMO and even if from BMO into BMO. So this, this, uh, this solves more or less the first of the two questions that I said that were left open for L infinity. Well, um, but before we get into that, uh, the second part, well, uh, I said that the second, the second question had to do with, with the dual of H1. So, so I guess that we need to, to, to get into uh, analytic BMO. So we are going to consider now the, the space that we are going to call BMO A. So analytic BMO, analytic bounded being oscillation. So BMO A is going to be the space of those functions F, which are analytic, so we want them to be analytic, and in the this and are the Poisson integral of F function, which is in BMO. 
Uh, well, of course, this is equivalent to say that DMO A is the space of those functions which belong to the Hardy space H1. And so the boundary value function, the function which to every A theta, same is to the boundary value F I theta, this is an almost everywhere defined function, so that this function is in here. So BMO A, analytic BMO A, is a subspace of H. And of course, we have the, the uh, having in mind the, the norm that we defined before well, for PMO. Actually, I'm going to work with the, with the conformally invariant characterization. If we take a function in BMO A, so um, the, the norm that we defined before was the, the, the mean of, of the function F over the circle, but the mean of the function, of this function, the boundary values is the value of F at C. So, and then here we take, we take it. So this is the definition of, of the P BMO not of F. So BMO is the space of the function F in H1, so that the boundary values are in BMO and these are uh, north, well, north for P bigger than, than one are north, which are um, equivalent north in the space B and O. Let me see. Uh, here, um, here we have that, that looking at this, since this is true for, for any, this has to, this, the, this supremum is finite for any P uh, bigger than zero. So in particular, we have that BMO is contained in HP for, for, for all P, uh, for all finite but P. Uh, and of course, H infinity, since, since we said in the beginning that L infinity was contained in BMO. Of course, H infinity is contained in BMO. And of course, the inclusion, the inclusion is, is a strict. Um, the example that we had before was the function log of, of absolute value of t. So, uh, so we have this example. So the function f equal log of one over, over one minus that is a function which is in BMO minus N infinity. This can be seen, well, uh, taking into account that the log of T, well, that this is the boundary values are essentially, um, these are like, like log of T. But if you prefer, you can see that this function has, um, the, the imaginary part of this function is bounded. So if we use the result that we have used, um, the, the previous result, then we immediately get that this function is in BMO because the imaginary part is bounded, then the function has to be in this. So this is a typical example of BMO or a BMO function, which is not in a situation. So we have a space which is between uh, H infinity and all uh, HP spaces for P is smaller. But there is, there is some space which uh, show up, which is a quite important space. I, I guess the the block space, the block space, I think it was, no, I think it was considered, for instance, in the course of Berman spaces. Uh, I, I you recall that, for instance, it was proved that the dual of the A1 was the block space and so on. So the block, is, block function uh, show up in many contexts in analytic uh, function space. And you know that, uh, well, uh, you know the definition of a block function, a, uh, an analytic function in the this is a block function, is the supremum of this, uh, the of f prime of set absolute value times the distance from set to the boundary is bound. And the space of all block function is called the block space. If we add f of zero, then we have actually, a mod. this is of course a Banach space. And I, and I said, this space was, in considering when in the course in Berman spaces, and it was proved that it was, uh, it is the, the dual of the Berman space A1. Well, let, let me see. In something very simple. If we use the Cochise formula for the derivative, we uh, obtain, we have that if we have any function f in H1, then we simply use Cochise formula for the derivative, we have this equality. And then this is, uh, then you write this in terms of parameterization and so on, and then you immediately get that this is smaller than the H1 norm of F. So for any function F in H1, we have that F prime of zero absolute value is bounded by the H1 norm of F. 
if we take a function f, which is which is in BMO, and we apply this not to f but to this function. Uh, phi a composed with a minus f of a. So we take a function f in a in BMO a, and we apply this inequality, this inequality, just to this function. Then we immediately get this. So what do we have here? So what what uh, what, what do we have? We obtain. We have obtained that we have a function f in BMO a. Then the supremum of these quantities is bounded uh, as a ranges over uh, the disk. So what we get is that if f is in BMOA, then f is a block function. So what we get is BMOA is contained in the block in the block space, and actually we have this inequality of the norm. The supremum of these quantities is bounded by this. So the block north or the block north of f is bounded by the BMA1 north of it. So we have. This. Well, of course, uh, for for block function, this this uh, this inequality is trivial because if the f prime uh, has a is f prime of set is big O of one over one minus set, then uh, from that integrating we get this inequality. This inequality is true for block function, and then of course it's true for BMO function. Of course, this this estimate is shared because we have seen that the function log of one over one minus set is a BM function. So this estimate that we obtain simply because a, a block function, a, a BM function, sorry, is a block function. Then actually, this inequality is sharp just taking that function log of one over one minus set. Okay. Well, the inclusion, I, we have said that BMO is contained in the block space. The inclusion is a strict. Uh, pro, uh, um, for instance, you all know well, uh, that this function, uh, this function, the sum of c to the 2 to the k, is a block function. In, in general, this is a function uh, which is given by Hadamard series. And for block function, it, it is quite easy to prove that, that uh, the Taylor coefficient of a block function are big O of one, but if you consider a power series of Hadamard with Hadamard gaps, then a power series with Hadamard gaps uh, is a block function if and only if the, these Taylor coefficients are bounded. So in particular, this function, this function given by this uh, uh, power series with Hadamard gaps is a block function. But of course, this is not, this, uh, this, this function, this, this cannot belong to BMO. Why? Why? Well, we can see this in many ways. One way is that well, you know that this function is not does does not have radial final radial limit at at, at, at at any point of the of the boundary. If you are familiar with the theory of power area with Hadamard gap, so this function is not in any of the Hardy spaces. And since we know that BMO is contained in, in all the Hardy spaces, P H P for P. It's more than one that we have. But anyway, we can see if, if you are not so familiar with the theory of Hadamard series, then this, this function is not in H2 because the sum of the absolute value of the coefficient square is infinity. It's not in H2, but BMO is containing B in, in, in H2. So, so it's, it's trivial that this function is a block function, but it's not in BMO. So, mm, and something which is not so simple is the, is the following, that actually there is a block function. There is a block function f, which lies in all the Hardy spaces HP, with p smaller than infinity, but is not in BM. This is not so easy to prove. But I'm not going to give the detail. Let me see that. I think that it was first proved by Campbell, Sima, and Stephenson in 1980, and they to prove this result, they used the system of a certain universal covering map and a property with an, an stability property of BMO. This stability property of BMO says that if we have a non-constant inner function, I, then, and the function I composed with H is in BMO, then H is in BMO. Then using this result and, a, and any universal covering map, the Campbell, Sima, and Steven were able to prove that there exists a block function with adding all the hard spaces, HP with P less than infinity, but not in the 
this, as I said, the 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 they were left, it was approved by Campbell, Sima, and Stephen. But later on, Holland and Tuemi uh, gave another proof, and they use uh, a result of Pfefferman on the Taylor coefficient of the function. I will speak about this result of Pfefferman later on, but let me see that there is another proof of the result, um, which is uh, using Taylor coefficient and a theorem of Taylor coefficient. Of, um, I, I would say that probably is a more explicit example because it's what's given, it gives you a certain coefficient and so on. But and I will speak a little bit about this theorem that I'm mentioning here later. But actually, even, even a result even stronger than this is true. And this was proved by Kwong. And actually, in the result is the following. There is a block expansion, which is not in BMO. And so that F prime is in HP for all P is smaller than one. This result is stronger than this, because if F prime is in HP for all P is smaller than one, then F is in HP for all P is smaller than infinity. So this result actually is stronger than this, than the one that I, I have written. But anyway, I'm not going to give details of this. They can found in, in this, um, in the paper that I, I mentioned before. But then anyway, I will try, if I, I will write a, a manuscript for the proceedings and then I will try to give some ideas on some of the results that I, that I mentioned. Okay. The second, the second, the second main result on, on hardy spaces that I mentioned, um, what was true for P less than infinity, but it was not true for P equal to infinity was the duality. The duality says that, uh, the, the duality theorem for hardy spaces says that the dual of HP is HP prime, HQ, the, where P prime or Q is the, Conjugate exponent of P, and this is true for P between one and infinity. And as I said, the, the result does not remain true for P equal to one. The substitute was proved by Pfefferman. This is what we call the, the Pfefferman duality theorem. Essentially says that the dual of H1 is BMOA. So it can be identified with BMOA. In, and it's not going to be an isometric identification in the same, in the, the dual of HP is, a, is HQ and we have a, a, an isometric identification. This is not, but, um, but let me see, this, this is a precise statement. If we have a function in BMO, then, uh, and we take a function G in H1, then this limit, we integrate F EI theta times G of R e I theta, and we take the limit as R tends to one, this limit exists, this is the first. And then also if we have a function f in H1 and we define T sub f uh, in this way, for any function g in H1, we, we define T sub f of g equal to this limit that I have said in, in one that exists. So we define this as a limit. This, then this T sub f is a, a bounded linear functional in H1. And actually, there are, the, the node of TF, we cannot say that is the same as the beam or node of F, but we uh, can say that there are two constants that the node of TF is uh, bigger than C1 times the beam or node of F and smaller than the other constant times the beam or node of F. And the converse is true. If we have any, any T, any T in the dual of H1, then uh, this T is one of these. Then I guess uh, it's time, no? It's time to stop. So, um, so I, 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 I will stop here. This is the, the statement, the precise statement of the Pfefferman duality theorem. And then we will try to, to get tomorrow into some idea of, of how we, we get. So I guess that I will stop now. Okay, so. All right, so uh, I'll manage uh, questions here. So either sh shout them out or post them in the uh, chat. And I guess, Danielle, you'll, uh, with me, keep an eye on the chat. All right. Um, 
Danielle, uh, you know, th there are these theorems by Pichorides that talk yeah. about the best constants and things. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of equivalent norms on BMO. Are there mm -hmm. theorems like that, which give you the best constant? And the best constant uh, on the, the best constant on, 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 on what, on the, on the conjugation? Well, you have like a F, F star and F double star and then F. Well, yeah, yeah, there, there are some, some results like this. There, there are a lot of, of, of results that, that about computing the the BMO or of this team or this team uh, function and so on and there are some 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 result of, of this kind of thing ah, okay um and uh let's see a comment here i guess you're going to post the slides in the chat and and yes. keep them well i guess that since I've, i found some erratas then i will correct them and i will post them maybe tomorrow okay okay Okay, um, then I will uh, post, yeah, I guess then maybe I will post, uh, I, I'm not sure how to do it. I was trying to post the paper that I, that I mentioned, but, but I'm not sure if I, um, well, I, I will do tomorrow, okay? Okay, Since and that, I yeah. found some erratas in this, and then I will post it tomorrow. And I okay. guess get, the person to get with is uh, Javad, who's the okay. master of all this. So. Well, then, uh, I, I, otherwise, I will send it to him, and then he will. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Just sh shout them out. I, I can't keep track of any raised hands or anything. Uh, just a, a question, Daniel, about the dual HP, which is HQ. And uh, a couple of times you mentioned it's uh, isometric isomorphism between mm -hmm. the two. I, I recall in Duran's book, he emphasizes that uh, well, it is true that the dual is HQ, but it's not isometric because just for P equal to two, but for other values, we have constant which appears in marshall reese theorem. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, it's not isometric, but we have the constant the same as the constant you mentioned in, the, in your last slide. Yes, sure. Uh, maybe, maybe, you are, maybe I'm, I'm not sure. I, I guess. You, I guess you are right, okay? I mean, the, this is, I mean, I have to double check with Duran's book, but this is something I vaguely remember. Mm -hmm. No, but I was, I thought, yeah. I have Duran's book here. <laughs> uh, HP studies isometrical isomorphic to the, uh, let's see. Um, mm -hmm. No, 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 you are right. It's isometrical isomorphic to the, to, oh, to a cos in space, and then if we go to HP, then, then we have a cost. So you are completely right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Sandra, you look like you're trying to jump in with a question. Maybe not. No, it's okay. <laughs> it oh. has solved itself. Thanks. All right. So, uh, last call for questions. Otherwise, let's thank. Uh, Danielle, again, for a wonderful talk, and we look forward to uh, tomorrow. Uh, let's take a quick break.